everyone. I know that everybody, that I, at least everyone I meet, has a passion for music, whether it's listening or if you're fortunate enough to be, such as my guest, to be able to play music. Uh, I enjoy it. As I say, the, my lack of talent never stopped me from enjoying getting together with people to get together and play, whether it's one person, a band, uh, a sing-along, or with uh, my special guest here who is, is just beyond a maestro in, in, my, in my eyes. Uh, he not only plays the meanest guitar, uh, and I, ha I had to finally start complaining on Facebook. He'd show these beautiful pictures, Bob, of these beautiful guitars. I'm the guy, I'm clicking on the picture saying, no, I want to hear the thing. Don't just tell me this. What a tease. Come on, Bob. Bob finally I know, acquiesced. I get, I get a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> finally acquiesced. I got to hear him do some playing. And I said, my day has been made, uh, Bob. Too, now it's too short. Now I'm going to play. It's a little too short. I want to get the whole song, but I'll take what I can get. I'll, Bob, I'll make sure. Remind me to actually play something while we talk today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, whether we get to it or not, not only is Bob an accomplished player, uh, but he works on guitars, he builds them from scratch, and he's some of the musical power behind the Michael Chiklis band. Yes, Michael Chiklis, the actor. Yes, the shield, the commish, the thing. Uh, Michael influence, there it is. Soon as you, now listen, you want to hear all of this, everything that Bob has to say, but you want to listen to influence uh, when you get through here. That's a must. That's an absolute Great album. Must. Really good album. It's a good classic rock album in the in the true spirit of uh, the um, the the eighties and nineties classic rock artists. There's a little Bruce Springsteen sound and stuff in there. There's some Latin stuff. There's some straightforward rock. We have Steve Lukather on the album, uh, who um, is uh, I'll get this out of the way right now, only because. You grab it because I don't want you to forget anybody. No, we'll talk about fun <clears throat> stuff. But the album okay. is called Influence, right? So I've been playing with Michael Chiklis uh, my whole life. We're childhood friends from Andover. And uh, we've always created, we've always been in bands. We've always uh, played live. But it really escalated um, along with Michael's celebrity uh, in television and movies. And we finally put this album together. And coincidentally, although I am the principal songwriter in the Michael Chiklis ensemble, Michael wrote all these songs. Wow. And what he did, which was smart, is that he wrote some really good basic songs and then he assembled some of the finest musicians around. Yeah. Well, on, on, this, um, on this record, we have Steve Lukather uh, playing guitar. We have uh, pretty much the entire Conan O'Brien band. Wow. Uh, from, uh, from his television show, the horn section, his keyboard player, some other great musicians from the Los Angeles area, myself and Michael. Um, and um, it's a great album. There's 11 songs on here. Uh, it all started uh, because of this little thing right here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now this was a song that I wrote with Michael um, called Till I Come Home. And this is what inspired and created the opportunity for us to play with the Boston Pops. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. In 2011. Not just play. This is 4th of July. This is big time. 4th of July. In on Boston. The Esplanade. Ha Esplanade. The hat shell. Come on. Come on. From Boston uh, Boys? That's big. That is big. Tens of One thousands. Of, biggest of, tens of thousands of people in the audience. Um, and even more on TV watching. Even more on TV. And the most gorgeous two days, July 3rd, you do it on July 3rd and on the 4th. So to, like a dress rehearsal day. Two of the be most beautiful days uh, of the summer. Perfect weather. Uh, terrific. So we wrote this song. It was all about, it's a story of, uh, um, of a soldier who's coming home. And he's writing a love letter. And we did it in the style. You check this out. It's called Till I Come Home. And you can even find uh, the, the actual performance on... Um, on YouTube, where uh, where I play this guitar. Oh, and, amazing! You know all the signatures from, oh, uh, awesome. from the event and Keith Lockhart and everybody. So I painted this guitar in my garage uh, <laughs> three days before the gig. Bob, secret workshop. You should call my it the secret, secret workshop. My <laughs> AKA secret garage. garage. <laughs> <laughs> True. 
So I wanted to come out on stage just and, and just have every single camera on me. And, and I achieved that goal in spades because um, I was the only guy on that stage. What is this? Oh, this is my vote button. <laughs> yeah, because, because you go awesome when you voted. That's good. Yeah. So uh, I walked out on stage on this with this thing and just about every camera uh, was on me for that moment, uh, stealing a little bit of <laughs> thunder from there. But look at that thing. That's not Michael cool. Chiklis in a tuxedo. That's a lot of competition. So nobody's going to knock you for trying. It really was. I, I had a, a, a tall task. But anyway, this is the guitar that, uh, that I played during that show. And it was a, a lifetime experience. Awesome. Awesome. Another one. Another one, pal. Now, what I also love is I, we don't have time. We're going to have to go parts two, three through five miniseries because I'm yeah. always seeing all these beautiful guitars up behind you and around you. Oh, but yeah. what do you have yeah. sitting, sitting? Oh, come on. Now you're killing me. Now you're torturing me. Okay. Yeah. I do have my original, the first guitar my parents ever bought for me, my first electric. But I don't think I wish I, hear I, about wish that. I had that kind of dedication where, where, I, <laughs> where I still have. Them. I got to thank my mother for that one, Bob, as always. You know, she put it aside saying, I thought someday you stuck with the music, you'd enjoy this. But tell us about this beautiful instrument you have sitting in front of you. Okay, so, um, you know, it's just an interesting story is that having um, played the guitar for as long as I've, I've been playing the guitar, and I started very, very young at like four or five years old, Steve, wow. I started uh, on, being, and I was one of those kids that could just walk up to the piano and make it work. So I, I attribute this to, uh, to my, um, my parents who had uh, some magic formula in their DNA. Uh, I'll, I'll, all of my brothers and sisters can do it. There's just an innate ability uh, in our family. And, um, so having played the guitar, gone to Berklee College of Music, been a working musician out there playing in wedding bands and my band and just trying to play as many styles as I possibly could to make as much money as I possibly could, uh, I wound up with a lot of musical instruments in my possession uh, and a recording studio in my possession. So through that experience, you wind up having to fix things that break. <laughs> Sure. And um, I, being the kind of guy that I am, I'm a very do-it-yourself kind of a guy. Uh, I just well, learned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I learned the skills uh, and listened to the to the advice and knowledge that was passed on to me by people that I knew on on how to fix uh, things and fix guitars. And um, year after year after year, here we are now. You know, uh, 35, 40 years later. Um, and um, I actually have enough knowledge to repair, restore, and even build guitars. So, of course, what happens when you get good at something, Steve? You never right? get enough, yeah. Well, you never get enough, but the <laughs> next thing you know, there's a line forming uh, outside Bro. your house with people who want that. As soon as I came into the video business, I never realized how many people needed me to fix their VCR. And I was like, you know, <laughs> that's not really what I do, but I'll take a look at it. <laughs> anyway, so um, a lot of people ask me to, uh, to work on their guitars, and I've become sort of a guitar whisperer of sorts. Uh, my friend Ross, who... Uh, Ross Davidson, who's also a video uh, guy, uh, he owns this guitar. This is a late 60s Kauai Japanese jazz guitar, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, what we're doing with it is that obviously it's in trouble. Can't, can't um, play it right yet. Yeah, none of the knobs were working. There's a little uh, beak head, sort of a knob it, it selects the pickups in here mm -hmm. uh this is just the oldest and crustiest things that look like you know i don't even i can't i i have difficulty even looking at it so <laughs> what I'm visually gonna, <laughs> what the I'm problem do, too bob you you can tell it, anyone when we stop playing instruments for everybody they either end up in the basement or the attic the two worst places you yeah. can store anything so, uh, particularly for a, a, an instrument with wood strings and everything else. Yeah, they don't, they, they, they like to be out, they like to be maintained, they want to be cared for. So this guitar was not, well, it, maybe it was over cared for, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, didn't, um, it didn't land in a good place and then it stayed like that for a very long time. So we're going to save it, we'll gut everything out of it 
and totally rewire it with all fresh wire so it sounds great. There's no crackle and pops on it. Everything should work really good. But, you know, the, back in wow. the 60s, you know, the Japanese guitars coming out of the late 60s and early 70s were so nice. And you could see that, you know, you've probably seen some of the ones that have hundreds of buttons on them, you know, like, or, and, you know, four pickups, and it looks like a blender, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Those are really, really cool, too. Um, but some of the ones that are more classic are, uh, are really nice, uh, like this one. This is a, a jazz guitar. So we'll be working on that this week. And then... Um, and let me ask you a quick question. Sure. I know with cars, furniture, musical instruments, that you want to retain the original um, sound and you don't want to change so many parts that now you've destroyed the value of it. How do you know how far to go and how to, how to balance those, the, the 60s with, with today? Well, you, you do a little bit of research, right? And it's a little bit of, of that uh, sort of antiques roadshow mentality where <laughs> before you go ahead and start taking sandpaper to something, you should know what it is that you have because oftentimes the, um, the wear on the guitar can, in some cases, actually increase its value uh, from this sort of mojo perspective. You know, don't erase the mojo of a beautiful mm -hmm. antique guitar. So that's a perfect example in this guitar. You do not want to over restore this. I'll give you another perfect example of that. <laughs> now, this, is a thirty thousand dollar reason not to not to over uh, restore. This is a Gibson Super Four Hundred from nineteen sixty seven. Wow. Is this yours? Is this yours? No, this is not mine. This is a, a fellow Mike Bruno, who's uh, one of my cameramen okay. um, that I work with, and um, this was his dad's guitar. Wow, awesome! And his dad played it and put it away wet. And then 30 years later, Steve, somebody opened up the case. 30. And it was not pretty. All the pickups had green fuzz on them. This bridge was encased in green fuzz. This, luckily the wood was in good shape, but all the gold plating was in really, really tough shape. So I called a place in Nashville um, that uh, groans that does um, very expensive uh, classic instruments uh, of the most valuable. And I showed them pictures and he said, boy, you better be careful with that. Mm. Um, and the advice that he gave me was very much as what you said. He said, do not over restore this thing. Mm. Clean up everything that was r rusted and pick it all away meticulously and surgically. Mm -hmm. clean it and then polish it and leave it don't try to fix the gold don't try to you know do anything with the luckily the wood on this thing is you, you want to leave some of the original patina yeah yeah he said don't try to over clean the binding to make it all white uh, again um, you know clean it up and make it nice and this thing <laughs> Um, Beautiful. Sounds so good. And you put it through an amp. Pure jazz. Okay. And it's the biggest jazz guitar that Fender ever made. This thing is enormous. But a perfect example of a guitar that was in serious trouble for leaving it in a case for way mm -hmm. too long. Um, and what not to do. It was an exercise in what not to do. I, I was in a basement not too long ago uh, working on this old house. And no. in the corner, I see a Fender case. And I said, this may sound like a strange question. Can I see the guitar? He said, oh, it's not in the case. I said, do you still have the guitar? He goes, yeah, I think it's up in a closet somewhere. And similar to your friend, his father had bought it brand new back in 72, Fender Telecaster. And I said, as I say to people, you can dance with a guy's date, but always ask before you play his guitar. I mean, that's just a good rule of thumb. In both cases, you should always ask. Do you mind? And he said, no, not at all. So it was, you know, not badly out of tune, but it, 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 it's, 
the most beautiful instruments should be played by, I'm not saying by me, it should be by me. I don't mind playing them, but you don't have to ask me twice, but they should be played because that's the best thing you can do. That's what they were created for. And so it's this thing just had beautiful, no, I didn't even get a chance to plug it into an amp, but just playing it, like you said. Um, I think that wood gets sad when it's left alone in general, uh, whether that be a cabinet <laughs> or a, uh, an antique, a table, a chair, a guitar. Now with the guitar, because there's a tonal quality in the guitar, it gets really sad when it's, when it's left alone. Sure. Wood wants to vibrate on a musical instrument. And as it's played and that wood resonates, it sweetens over years. That's why when you see these, uh, these Stradivariuses that are like hundreds of years old and you draw a note on there, that wood has a quality to it that's unlike any wood in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, it stands to reason that that wood's going to sound a lot different and resonate a lot different than any wood in the world. So you want your guitars to be played. Um, you know, they're, they're people. Absolutely. And speaking of wood, the other story that you came across on Facebook was where you were building guitars from scratch. And I'm like, of course he does that because fixing them up just doesn't keep him busy enough, I guess. But tell us about how playing guitar just isn't enough for you. You want to, you want to, you know, create them from dirt. My wife has a, has a new phrase that she uses for me. It's called extra. She says, I'm extra. <laughs> Good. I'm extra on everything. I can't just have a baked potato. You know, okay. I just have to have everything on it. I can't have a guitar that just is like a regular stock guitar. It has to be extra in some way. So in the spirit of extra, um, I decided that I would like to make a guitar on my own. And I did, I did it one time before when I was very, very young, you know, in, in, the, um, in the wood shop in, in elementary mm -hmm. school. Sure. And we had a piece of wood and we made a guitar and I put a neck on it from, you know, another old guitar. And, uh, but that was when I was just a little kid and now I'm an adult and I have some skills and, you know, I just love wood. So in a moment of, uh, no adult supervision, <laughs> um, Mr. I Extra, went, yep, I went to, um, I went to the local, uh, lumber yard and I, uh, and I bought a bunch of strips of wood and I glued them all together. Now, you know, I watched the TV show, Let's see, you know. Uh, so not only am I a fan of your work, but, uh, Thank I, you. I, I love, uh, I love the content that you guys do. Um, and, uh, so, you know, if I'm going to be, have a little bit of a norm moment, uh, I glued up some wood. I took his recommendations on how to do it oh. right. <laughs> I will let him know. Uh, please do. I clamped it all together and, um, and then, uh, and made this panel. Now, I thought, okay, this is going to be my sort of beta test uh, prototype guitar. I'm going to throw every single idea that I have at this thing, and then I'll break it all down and sort out a guitar that I'll really want to make. Um, because it was just, you know, cheap wood. I think that there's oak and poplar and pine and, and um, I don't What made you decide on the species of wood or that piece? The look or the, you knew you wanted a variety of woods? Uh, it was what was in aisle seven. <laughs> Good. Okay, that works. <laughs> so I was in aisle seven, and I thought, okay, here's my guitar. What, let's. <laughs> and I had thirty dollars. There it is. There it is. An aisle seven of the supermarket. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Two, two, two criteria. What was in that aisle uh, at um, at Lowe's, and uh, and and what would cost thirty two dollars and eighty six. Okay. Good. Good. So uh, I did it, um, I glued it together, uh, I cut the shape, which is a uh, reminiscent of um, the shape of Brian May's guitar, mm -hmm. um, which I actually have one of those back there. Uh, but I wanted it to be a little bit more distinctive in the way that I like it. And I also had this idea of the sort of yin yang um, that, I, that I wanted to do. So you're gonna maintain that? You're not gonna cover that with a coat of paint? No, I'm or at least not, not yet. To. No, no, this is all okay. going to be. And originally, what I was going to do is that this piece right here was going to be a pick guard. So it was going to be white and then natural wood. But then, of course, when you're working on this projects, and you know as much as anybody uh, having seen that process unravel, is that it's very organic. 
So as I was working on this guitar, I, and my father actually, Lou Pascarella is a, uh, he, he's a wood carver and he makes duck decoys uh, in his basement. Mm. You know, he fiddles down there, you know, he's 82 years old and he carves. Awesome. Things. So he's always got me interested in wood carving. Um, and then the next thing you know, I started carving into this thing. And because I wanted to have fun. Give it dimension. <laughs> Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Absolutely. Did you use a router? What tool did you use no. or just carving? Carving tools. All hand <laughs> Mr. Extra, sorry. All hand tools. Oh, good for you, Bob. I'll show you my tool. Look at you, he's got it right there. But it's, you, can, you can have whatever magical tool you want, it's the artisan, always. It's a sharp piece of metal, you know? Yeah. And very, very- And cool. your imagination. And your imagination and a whiskey sour. <laughs> Maybe that you can nickname it, whiskey sour. You get a name of your guitar, right? It's not called guitar. That's that's my the wife, species. My wife Johanna is the namer of guitars. So okay, all right. She's very clever about that. When we so do our I part two, we'll get her in here to name it, to officially when you finish it. It's uh, it's likely she may come flying in here. Um, <laughs> But I do call this the yin yang. Uh, and what we'll do is that this centerpiece here will be uh, dark and this will be light. So this strip will, you know, and I was just drawing on this thing with the pencil thinking, you know, what can I do? How can I make this thing weird? And that's what I came up with. So, you know, we'll put the pickups in it and then the neck goes on uh, okay. here. And then you'll also see- What's the, the where'd you get the neck? Uh, this came off of a-, a Aisle a, nine? Um, I, I think it was aisle nine. <laughs> okay, next. But I am carving it in the same spirit. Oh, yeah. Of that sort Love of it. raised beveled edge. Love it. And uh, yeah, so that's going to be uh, something. This is a slow moving project. though. That's okay. Inspiration has no timetable. It does. It's beautiful. I love what you're styling, but make sure you let us know when it's the unveiling. We're going to hook you up to an amp. And I will give you one last uh, experience because you did say Fender. Okay, right? uh, yeah, was, sure. You can't talk about guitars without talking about Leo Fender, right? Absolutely. So you have just your straight up Fender Stratocaster and it's got the um, little bit of a clear finish on it and of course, because I'm extra, my guitars have to be extra too. This one has a humbucker in it and typical Stratocaster would be uh, three single coil pickups, but this one is extra. Extra, what year is this? Uh, this is probably an early nineties, maybe 91. Okay. 92, uh, but this is what, you know, you would really, this is your dependable, you know, gig guitar, you know. Just, this is the guitar that you take out and you use on a gig and you make money with it. it sounds great, it does everything you want to do. It'll play rock, it'll play jazz, blues. Just your, just a good solid Fender Stratocaster utility knife. Awesome. And, um, I get a lot of these uh, through um, my hands uh, because so many people have them is that this is kind of where I learned to fix guitars. Okay. On Fender guitars. And luckily, they haven't really reinvented the guitar dramatically uh, since its inception. Okay. Um, except now you have the electronics can be really, really crazy. Uh, you know, these pickups turn into little computers mm -hmm. and circuit boards. And I just had one of those guitars on my bench just a little while ago. It made me crazy. <laughs> and it also makes me uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the classic uh, magnet pickups cloth covered wire and a volume and a tone knob. <laughs> Keep it awesome. Simple, right? you, you must have heard the Eddie Van Halen story where he took his guitar apart, couldn't put it back together. So he just said, heck with it. I'll just go straight from the, the pickups to the, you know, to the plug kind of situation. Yeah. There's a purity to that too, which mm -hmm. created his sound. And you know, in the, in, in, Considering the Eddie Van Halen story, I think that that was probably one of the first times that we publicly knew of an artist that said, screw it. 
I'm going to rip this guitar apart and I don't care if it's pretty looking or if it's nasty looking, I want it to sound the way I want it to sound and I want to make it my own. And it became a storied um, guitar. Uh, Brian May, of course, is the other one. He, you know, mm -hmm. Him and his dad went into their into his father's uh, shop and took a part of a, a, a fireplace mantelpiece and created one of the most famous guitars in rock and roll history, the Red Special. Mm -hmm. And um, that guitar today is still uh, played by Brian uh, with very, very little modification that he did in the, I believe it was the night, late 1950s, early 60s when he, him and his father wow. played that guitar. What Inspiration. You, Inspiration. What you even show you. This now the other guitar, if you have it close by, there it is. Yep, this is the now this is the the remake of the Brian May guitar. Um, yeah, you're gonna have Brian's guitar. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you would have to steal that one, which would have been worth doing, Brian May. Oh gosh, well I didn't want mine to be red because I thought that that would be too fanboyish, so I went for the gold <laughs> sparkle. Awesome. Um, this is wonderful, wonderful guitar. Um, it's got so much features in it that it would take all day to describe, but. Um, I, one of my treasured guitars. So you have a guitar for whatever kind of mood of type of music, because even though they could be Fenders, they all kind of feel and work and sound a little different from each other. So I imagine mm -hmm. whatever you happen to be in the mood, you say, hey, let me grab this one for, this is what I feel like playing right now. Yeah, there's two philosophies really um, that uh, for musicians, playing musicians, is that I have one guitar that does everything. Hmm which is a, a good philosophy. And that's almost like your, your typical Fender Stratocaster, this um, modern, fairly modern technology in there that will make the guitar sound like anything that you really want. But when you start getting into the vintage guitars, they're a little bit more specific and a little bit less flexible. So you would want to play a guitar that had the qualities of a, uh, of a certain style. Like say, if you were a surf player, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you played surf music. Well, you probably want to play something like this because this is like your traditional surf, 60s surf uh, sound, you know? Okay. Yeah. And what do the switches that. do? I'm looking at switches between the pickups. Um, this one will select this pickup or this pickup. Oh, I'm sorry, this one, it's on off for each pickup. Okay on off of this one and on off of that one. And then uh, master tone and master volume. Okay. Surf's up. Surf's up. Surf's um, up, buddy. You know, Can, so hey, you know what the other guitar, I want you to grab if it's nearby. I've seen this piece of artwork. It, it's more artwork than guitar, if you will. Um, it had gauges on it, oh, pipes. It had, it had everything in the kitchen sink. Is that close uh, by or no? It is, it's very close by. The steampunk. The steampunk. <laughs> Okay. We'll wait. On, we'll wait. You go. You go. Because some people have to see this. All right. That's all right. <laughs> you only have so many wall hangers. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's oh, worth boy. it. See, it's so worth the wait. Gonna, no, I have to apologize. Is that there's a little bit of a never, Bob. This, this is the Bob Pascarella show. Do me a favor, put that right up to the camera so people can see the I, I see will. see the how much horsepower and the where your this, gauges are set for. This was one of those unsupervised moments <laughs> in my life. So one. This is that. steampunk, right? <laughs> awesome. So it started off as a Fender Stratocaster, or, or, or a copy of a Fender Stratocaster, and I always wanted to. I, I'm fascinated by the steampunk style. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like it was brought up from the bottom of the ocean, you know? Um, so in here, um, this is again, you know, more Home Depot fun, right? So uh, these tubes- Aisle four. Breathe yeah. li life, uh, <laughs> lifeblood into this guitar, which then goes into some piping. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Then there's a valve here that controls a pressure uh, Good. PSI valve. And then inside here is uh, some old walkie talkie parts. You remember those old 60s walkie talkies, the plastic? Sure. They were more interference than, than voice, but sure. <laughs> well, I pulled one apart and created um, 
all this mess. Now that doesn't really work. It's just for oh, decoration. I thought that was the speaker blob. No, un unfortunately, it's just. What kind of mood is Blob in when he plays picks this baby up? Well, you got to be in a crazy mood because, again, <laughs> as as the thing evolved, you'll notice there's no frets on this thing. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I made it a fretless guitar. Now you've heard of fretless basses. Mm -hmm. um, not many people play a fretless guitar, and, and you'd be hard pressed to play a G chord on this thing, to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, when you're soloing, you get a very violin kind of tone. Mm. With it. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very exact science. Um, so it does actually sound pretty cool. Um, but, you know, it really is a, a, an exercise in uh, irresponsible design. <laughs> um, you know. No way, Bob. Don't listen to anybody. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when you've gone too far. Or your wife. You get to listen to your wife. That's beautiful. <laughs> that is a piece of artwork. And it plays. It does play. You can and figure out where the G chord is. You can is play that. I know. Well, I guess you could do it. There you go. But it really is more of a, um, you know. It's a steampunk sound. So uh, it, it just really is what it awesome. is. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, love it. Isn't that funny? I love it. Well, I know, as soon as I saw that, I said, wait a second, this was kind of like one of those photos. Oh, here's another one I have. By the way, and you try to change the subject. Oh, no, 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 get back to, I think your pressure's low, Bob. That's the, only, that's the only thing I had to ask you. Now, let me ask you, if you had a magic wand mm. and throughout the history of mankind, you could, you could assemble the ultimate band that you'd like to play with, who would your main vocalist be? Wow. Who would your bass player, drums, and keyboard be? And you can be backup singers. You can have uh, Boston Pops. You, you, you have fun with the Bob. Anytime, anybody in the history of mankind. Well, I'm very fortunate to play with the musicians that I play with. And um, I feel that uh, being the worst musician in the band is, is, a, is in, in my particular case, a, a good thing. Because uh, now being exposed to a lot of Los Angeles musicians who are incredibly talented, um, that dream has come true in many ways for me. But if I were really to go deep in the fantasy world, um, I always loved the band Heart. Mm, yep. Um, with the two sisters. Um, and they, uh, and that band really had a lot of great things for me. They were rock, they had incredible voices, incredible harmonies, great hooks. So um, I would probably say that um, the Wilson sisters uh, would be my, my, my choice lead singer. Uh, and I, I know I always loved female vocalists too. So I just always thought that Pat Benatar was just had a voice on her too. And if mm -hmm. I ever wanted a lead singer, a female lead singer in a band, you can put Pat Benatar in okay. front of uh, my band any day. <laughs> um, bass players, you know, I would probably create a, a Frankenstein band that couldn't function on a normal level because I would pick, you know, jazz bass players like Jaco Pistorius. Um, and um, and uh, fusion guitar players like John McLaughlin and Jeff Beck, you know, people that just don't belong together. I would put together. <laughs> you know. It's okay. It's a dream uh, band. It's a dream band. Anyways, uh, you know, the, the drummers would be, um, you know, I, I used to listen to Rush because I always thought that Neil Peart was a great drummer. Um, but I now have a, a far deeper respect for the drummers who lock in to a really tight groove and aren't so busy. Uh, in their playing. So I like, uh, that's why I like uh, classic rock bands that just really have a great driving beat to them. And, uh, and a lot of those drummers that are in there that you wouldn't normally uh, say would be a great drummer. A lot of people don't think that when they think about drummers, they don't go to Ringo Starr. But, you know, listen to an old Beatles, Beatles record and Ringo didn't play the drums. Ringo contributed musical ideas to those songs that were as significant as the lyrics mm -hmm. and the, uh, I mean, he played the drums like an instrument. He wasn't just dropping a backbeat in there. His riffs and his fills that he did were as signature as the melodies in those songs. So I have a deep respect for Ringo. And, and when he knew when not to play. So like, yeah. let it be. It's just the piano. It starts off simple and then he works his way into it. 
and and that's just as impactful. Right, and he was one of the first drummers that would go do 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 do, and that that don't do go don't. It was lazy and slow, and then you know you probably didn't give much thought of it at the time, but. As you keep listening to those Beatle records, you, you think, wow, I mean, these guys really belonged together. Yeah, exactly. Like you were talking about your dream band may not work well together, but the Beatles for that time in history, I mean, they changed the world where their impact is still felt today. Yeah, they really did. And if there was a bunch of uh, lads from uh, Liverpool that, that should, could, and did get together for all the right reasons, uh, it was those guys. So, mm -hmm. um, and they influenced everybody, you, me, and all in between. Absolutely. Who in the, your early days, who was your biggest influence, uh, either personally or professionally, uh, you know, guitarists that you looked up to or just, you know, family members that supported you? You know, funny that you should say family members because I attribute everything that I do musically to my brother, Michael. Um, my brother uh, is three years older than me and he was, uh, he took the first steps into um, music and guitar and in my my desire to exceed his, uh, the little brother, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I needed everything that he had, to, everything that he could do, I wanted to try to do better, uh, which was a motivating <laughs> factor in my life to gain as much skill as I have today. And I'm still chasing his abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, he was a, a, a main influence in my musical life. But uh, professionally, um, once I started to take guitar lessons and really figure out, you know, like, how do I do this, you know, in a traditional and uh, immeasurable way, um, I gravitated towards the blues guitar players, you know, so Jimi mm -hmm. Hendrix was a big influence on me. There was a guitar player named Robin Trower, mm -hmm. uh, who was a, a, a tremendous Jimi Hendrix style player. I think I learned more from listening to his records than I did uh, in any guitar lesson that I've, I've taken. But, you know, I'm a big old sponge, Steve. I, I you know, it, I learn from the, from the smallest and the greatest resources. I've given guitar lessons to 11-year-olds where the kid did something. And I'd be like, huh, can you do that again? I <laughs> want he, that. What is that? He's like, I don't know. I'm 11. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you know what? You did something really cool, and I'm, gonna, and I'm inspired by that. So, you know, I... I just don't know. It, just comes from all, it comes from all angles. That's awesome. It is. It's music. It's the international language. And, and it's great. That's the one thing that uh, I, as a father, I said, I don't care what it is you play, the tambourine. You need to learn a mu one musical instrument. And we, uh, we struggle, like all of us, my son worked very, very hard, uh, went percussion route, um, and he played in his high school band and had the time of his life because it was a combination of friends, music, and they were out doing uh, football games, they were out parades, they were doing competitions, and it was just you know, the best of all the worlds. And it, yeah. I, as I said, once you learn how to play that musician, like I said about myself, I'll put the guitar down and not come back to it for a couple months. But when I do, you never forget, you, know, you just you pick it up. And as I say, I can sit in my office by myself, jamming by myself, and just get that similar buzz that I would sitting down with, you know, any other musician or musicians who are happy to tolerate me. You know, it's, it's just it's a true. great fun. Very rarely is there an activity that you can engage in that touch, that checks off so many boxes as, uh, as being a musician. Mm -hmm. For me in particular is that all the boxes that you mentioned get checked off and I come in here and I play the guitar all the time, you know. Uh, I have a recording studio downstairs with a stretching mixing board and there's drums and keyboards all over the place. Uh, I'll take you down there someday uh, and show you that. Uh, so that checks off a box. I repair and restore. I have a tremendous love for the machine. Mm -hmm. um, not only the music that it creates, but in and in of itself as a, as a piece of furniture, I, I have a deep love for the wood and the finish and the craftsmanship mm. and the design. So, you know, what a wonderful thing, you know, not only do you get to play the guitar, but you get to, you know, love it on so many <laughs> levels. It's just. Absolutely. Amazing. Let's, let's talk about technology. Cause I know in the world of video, everything has dramatically changed that it was, it's gone beyond space age for us, but how has, technology made your 
uh, life as a musician more fun and more challenging? Oh, um, significantly. And I would say that mostly that comes from the, re the technologies associated with the recording studio. Mm -hmm. um, to record music back in our early days, and I'm including you in, in when I say <laughs> Thanks, our <pal>. early days. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, um, <laughs> Demographic. Um, I would, you know, it was difficult to record music. You had to go into a recording studio and you need multi-track, you know, uh, tape machines and isolation rooms and an engineer and you needed to spend, you know, a tremendous amount of money to have mm -hmm. somebody operate that just to be able to put one track on top of another. Unless, of course, you were doing it like sometimes we did and you had one tape machine here and then you had another tape machine here and you press both and then you, you know, which we did that too, but creating real rewardingly um, quality music required being in a recording studio. Um, and, you know, who can afford this and who knew how to operate it, you know, mm -hmm. unless you studied that, you know, as a career choice. Uh, but the technology really made that easier. Uh, when we started to get into digital recording, we got to a point fairly quickly where if you had a decent laptop and a couple of little, you know, retail ready boxes, you can play your guitar and you can put microphones and, and keyboards and everything uh, right into your computer and the software would stack everything up. And software developers took a lot of time and effort to make it easy. Uh, and you had programs like GarageBand and, um, you know, uh, various home recording things and sometimes even like the you, you probably remember the little boxes uh like the Tascam. sure uh, oh yeah you had a four track recorder yeah. yeah you put a cassette in there and everything so that really from that technology it really started to get better and better as it gravitated more towards computers and now you're at a point where almost anybody with you know reasonable amounts of, of resources can create a recording studio and put together really high quality music. Uh, it doesn't play the guitar for you yet, gladly. That's good, yeah. <laughs> uh, you still need musical skills. Uh, you know, I mean, hip hop told us that you can take pieces of pre-recorded music and you mm -hmm. can create a new landscape and a new style of music from pre-recorded pieces. Uh, and that was fun and interesting. And I have respect for that. Yeah. Um, but if you're a musician and all you can do and you're a stupid person like me, all I can do is just play the guitar. Um, hardly, hardly block. <laughs> so I'll play the guitar. You don't just, I'll... trust me, pal, I've heard you. You don't just play the guitar. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm, my ability's up to playing, but you don't just play the guitar, but I appreciate love it. that. Well, you know, again, I'm a product of, um, of guitar training. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you should say that, Steve, is that, you know, technology made things a lot easier but it didn't make us more creative. Hmm. Um, it allowed creative to happen a little bit easier. Um, but I made a decision uh, long ago when I was a kid because I have a thirst to, to learn things. So there are musicians that are self-taught and they're incredibly talented. My brother is a self-taught musician, never took a guitar lesson in his life. And he has amazing abilities. I took a different path where I wanted to learn from as many people as I, as I possibly could to learn jazz and rock and heavy metal styles and blues styles and even country picking, which I, 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 some of the most talented musicians in the world are bluegrass musicians, you know? Um, and I just wanted to learn all of that. So going, taking guitar lessons, taking courses at Berkeley, um, you know, you get a lot of influences uh, put on you and, uh, and I, was fortunate enough to be in a situation where I could take advantage of all of it. Uh, all I have to do now is sort it all out and, and remember it. You know, and they yeah. say, <laughs> one of the things about being a musician is that you got to know it all, but when you pick up your guitar, try to forget as much of it as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by. Yeah. <laughs> Works in a lot of cases. Now, getting back to technology, one last thought. Um, in, in my imagination, I know you're a Boston boy like myself, and Michael Chiklis is an LA guy. So does technology make it almost seamless that when, hey, I've got this riff idea and the yeah. two of you can develop songs. Did you develop the Influence album a lot, you know, by Coastal Very, through technology? 
very, very much in that way. Um, you know, Michael and I benefit from working together because we're just brothers, you know, and, and mm -hmm. part of writing the song is us getting into a fist fight at some point. Sure. Um, and then at the end, we're like, wow, look what we did. Um, so it's a little bit of a compromise in, um, in songwriting, but the technology did take a, a huge hand. So we built him a, a studio in Los Angeles in his home uh, for the sole purpose of doing influence. And um, I went there, you know, several visits uh, to, uh, to not only get the studio wired together and, and operating, but also to start to do some basic tracks. But between my studio and his studio, we had a wonderful thing in between called the Dropbox. <laughs> and all you I know it well. Yeah. And all you had to do was just take your session and throw it in the Dropbox, and then I'd lift it out of there and download it onto my uh, uh, computer, add some tracks to it, Dropbox it back to him. And then we had another guy. So we had a triangle. We had actually four points in the creation of this album. Uh, Michael and I work with another producer called Anthony Resta. He's done work with, um, with Duran Duran, and he's just, you know, he does a lot of work with uh, Nuno Betancourt from Extreme. And then we also have another associate that we work with called, uh, whose name is Bob um, St. John. Bob St. John worked with Anthony in doing a lot of the Extreme albums, and he does a lot of Latin music in Florida. So we have these studios, right? My studio, Michael's studio in Los Angeles. Bob St. John's in Florida. Anthony was in Chelmsford at the time, but now he's in Los Angeles. And everybody's going back and forth, adding musicians, mixing. It all wound up landing in Florida in Bob St. John's hands. And he did the final uh, touches. But even at that point, Bob would call me up and say, hey, we need a guitar part here for the ending. Can you just record something? toss it in the Dropbox, and then uh, within minutes, he had it on his desktop. So the technology was amazing. It, it, it made thousands of miles uh, condensed to seconds. Sure. Made it possible. Yeah, so I am... It, it, would you say that's your proudest musical accomplishment, the Influence album, or what, what would you say is? Or give me your top three or five list. Well, you know... I'm also surrounded by Emmy Awards and, and about 30 or 40 tellies and Clios and things here. I, we use them for door, for door stops around here. Stop. It's, so, you, do you I, deserve them? Uh, well, thank you. Um, I, so my career as a songwriter was mostly in television um, and documentaries, advertising. So, you know, I have... A, a, a telly award here for a documentary that I did for uh, the Boston Garden called The Banner Years, where I scored the entire thing. And at one point, I, I even found myself conducting a string orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, some some musical accomplish, accomplishments that are solely to me that I'm very, very proud of. This record here, um, is Michael's pride and joy, and, and I'm his brother and partner in music, so I share in that. Um, but we are working on some music right now that's, um, that's uh, different from that record that I'm tremendously proud of. Uh, music that really is the culmination of Michael's background and his influences and my background and my influences, and they've come together in a very, very unique way, and it's kind of technological music there's a lot of synthesizers in it but there's an organic guitar to it as well so i'm very very proud of that you'll be hearing about some of that music coming up in the, in the near future let me know um, but that is going to be something else um so yes this is a, a wonderful album and, and um you know how often do you get a chance to play with quality musicians like this um you know uh so I think that this is uh, an amazing accomplishment. And we did some Los Angeles shows. So we got to, I got to perform with these musicians live, which was just, you know, big stage, big lights, uh, you know, rock club kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, just a, a, a rock musician's dream. Like, you know, playing with, with, with the Boston Pops on, on 4th of July was great um, because, you know, you don't really ever look back there and see 30 people behind you mm -hmm. 
and Keith Lockhart. Keith Lockhart next to you. <laughs> <laughs> just wailing away. So that was pretty amazing. But from a songwriting standpoint, when you're really creating something with somebody, you know, it's just an amazing, amazing collaboration that happens. And I treasure those. I, I really, really treasure the songwriting uh, part um, as well. So uh, awesome. we'll keep going, you know. Well, listen, Bob, I would love to keep going. And we're going to have to have a part two and three. I want to get you playing more. Uh, I'd love to have you sit down again with him and hear you do more playing. But people can reach out to the Michael Chiklis Band and other resources. Thank you so much for bringing us into your inner sanctum. Thank showing you. us just a, a small part of your collection. I would go through every guitar, you know me, I, I, yeah. but, well, next, but time, next time. Next time we meet, um, we'll, we'll do it downstairs in the recording studio and Absolutely. Then we'll, we'll really focus on what all, all these guitars sound like. And they're all Absolutely. very Absolutely. Because you also have a bunch of pedals, which uh, again, adds to your sound and the mood and everything else oh, this, that people have to crazy. see. Yeah, people don't want to see, but people have to see. So that's how it is. <laughs> they do, they need to see it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bob, again. It was great fun as always. Thank you. And thank you again. A great opportunity. Good luck. And I'll, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? Absolutely. All right. Thanks again.